Welcome to Climate and Cocktails, a series of conversations featuring the movers and shakers of the energy transition and climate change. My name is Jules Kortenhorst. I'm the CEO of RMI, where we focus on accelerating the energy transition to secure a clean, prosperous, zero carbon future for all. And today I am delighted to be joined by my dear friend, Damilola Ogumi. Damilola is the CEO and special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Sustainable Energy for All, and also the co-chair of UN Energy. Welcome, Dalila. Thank you so much for having me, Jules. Great. Let's start a little bit with your journey on energy and climate change. You and I first met each other when you were in charge of rural electrification in Nigeria, and you worked with RMI, but you've been passionate about this subject for a long time. Tell us about what brought you here. It's quite strange. I think I'm going to go a little bit further back. In university for my master's, I did um, my degree and I was looking at what subject area should I looked at. And I, and I focused on how infrastructure actually, you know, could evolve people out of poverty, basically, with the type of right infrastructure. And it seemed like a very fuzzy dissertation at the time. But, but what I was trying to say was that what policies could we put in place to make sure if there's the right infrastructure, especially energy infrastructure, it could be one of the foundations of lifting people out of poverty. And what I saw from that was that if you didn't give people sustainable energy, they wouldn't uplift themselves out of out of poverty. There's just that direct link. Um, and I was working for a big construction company. And then a few years later, my husband's like, we're moving back to Nigeria, which I was very upset about because I was going to be like a senior exec of my company. And I was like, fine, if I'm moving to Nigeria, I want to work with government. I want to make a difference. So I started working at the PPP office in Lagos State, which is public-private partnerships. And I just, you know, zeroed in on energy and how to provide sustainable energy for schools and hospitals and courthouses and government buildings to reduce their reliance on diesel and petrol generating sets. And then I got the bug with renewable energy. And we were really lucky to do, I think at that time, five megawatts of decentralized energies for schools and primary healthcare centers, went to the federal government. RMI was the first organization um, that I know of in the Nigerian context that actually dimensioned out the opportunity of clean energy and the opportunity of renewables. We always have a way of saying, you know, renewables is just, um, you know, um, just some light bulbs or, you know, some, some very little things. But what, what RMI was able to show was that there was a $14 billion opportunity a year. And that was really, really helpful data to allow us to kind of kickstart our program with the World Bank. It does sadden me that, you know, we're a few years um, after that. And, you know, Nigeria is probably one of the few countries that still has a functioning energy access program with the bank and AFDV, when we should have about a hundred of these running at this point. So, you know, there must be ways we can work faster and, and be more effective. And that's probably what really drove me to this role at the UN. I, I hadn't really seen anybody that looked like me um, in um, a leadership position or for the energy sector. And I thought it was important since I started very young, probably about 27 in government, 26, 27, it was good for people to see people who look like me so they understand the opportunities that they can have um, later on, um, especially for, for African women. Thank you. You made an incredibly important point there in, in the explanation of your early start of your journey, namely that energy is so linked to human development, right? This year, the COP is going to be in Egypt. It's going to be an African COP. And uh, that is a unique opportunity to tell that story, to tie the uh, human development dimensions of energy access uh, together with the equally important issue of climate change. What's your expectation for the COP, the climate negotiations in Sharm el-Sheikh? And what do you hope that the African COP will achieve this year? I think one of the most important steps, and you've been advocating this for many years, I'd like to thank you for that, is understanding that fundamentally energy access is part of energy transition. It is not either or. 
You can't ask people to transition out of stuff they don't have enough of. <laughs> you know, you have to make sure that when they're developing, they're developing in low carbon pathways. And that is what we would like to get across at COP. It's not that, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is a large emitter, but if you don't take this seriously and provide the right amount of financing, it can go the other way. And and and, and it is going the other way, unfortunately. We, we're in a continent that we have easily over 100 million diesel and petrol gensets blazing. So it's not big coal fire plants, but it is really, really important stacks to emissions. And, and more importantly, these aren't things you can stop or shut down or close. You don't even know how they're coming in because you haven't provided enough energy. So one of the things that, you know, for me, it's really, really important to advocate is energy transition plans and pathways that are financed by the global community. So, I, you know, I do think it's great that, you know, packages are being developed by um, for the Indian um, government, the Indonesian government. But what about countries that still have a population risk but are not, haven't developed their economies on coal? They shouldn't be left behind, right? Um, because it's just really, really important that they're given the same prominence. So we're not coming back you know, after 20 years trying to get them to transition, we have an amazing, unique opportunity to have people working in a low carbon pathway um, right now, understanding that this is just as much of a development issue as it is a climate issue. And one thing you highlighted in your comments just now is the importance of finance. And I think we all have to recognize that the developed world has made commitments on finance that it hasn't completely lived up to. And it's hard to see the scaling of the financial commitments at the speed that we need. So talk to me about what you expect out of the COP in Egypt in terms of finance and how can we help the global community to mobilize that capital to provide that access to energy that you just talked about. I think we need to be honest with ourselves as well. And we need to be honest that if this is really a crisis that we all say it is, then the money needs to come. We've all seen from the COVID crisis, which we're still living, the Global North found 17 trillion in six months overnight at less than 1% because it was a crisis that affected their economies. This is something that easily kills about 4 million women not having access to clean cooking every single year. I think that is an incredibly important statistic. Sorry to interrupt You're you. Would you sure. would you mind highlighting how that works and uh, for our audience, why is that such a tough reality? Because it is. It. I mean, it's a tough reality, especially for countries from the global south of which I come from, when people dying is not seen as a crisis, and people dying because of climate related issues and things we can fix is not seen as a crisis. You know, Jules, you spent a lot of time and analysis, and, and we've used a lot of analysis from RMI on, we know what to do. Yeah. That's not the problem, we know how much it's gonna cost. We actually have all the technology available right now to do the right thing and provide people sustainable energy in, an, in, in a climate-friendly way. It's, it's, it's and, and you know, and everyone talks about the will, but how do you translate that to practice? If it, if it still takes between two and five years to close on, on large commitments by development finance institutions that are meant to be the, you know, the, the, the heartbeat of this, how are we going to achieve SDG 7 by 2030? So we need to just be honest with ourselves that what we have in place doesn't work. And then what do we need to put it in place? Is it first loss? Is it, is it risk guarantees? What, what exactly would allow people to push the needle and do it in, in a way where it's, um, where it's done quickly? Because we're not going to get it perfect again. And again, that's a frustration when, you know, you can make mistakes on one side of the world, but on the other side of the world, you have to have these perfect things and perfect regulations and perfect formulas. That isn't real life. Um, you know, especially coming from Africa, projects drive policy. They always have done. No one's going to sign off and do laws if they don't know if your project could work. But things can move a lot faster because they're also a development um, agenda to that. I, I never thought in, you know, in my lifetime I'll be talking to African governments about removing fuel subsidy. But it's happening now, right? But what is not happening is the response on the other side. 
But when they put that back on, or if they increase fuel subsidy, everyone's going to complain that, oh, how dare them do this? But no one's going to talk about the fact that funding is needed now. So in my country, Nigeria, with an energy transition plan, between to achieve net zero by 2060, it's going to cost something like $1.9 trillion. That's with everything perfectly in place, of which $410 billion is above business as usual spending. Yeah, it's a big country and you understand that and has a big and oil and gas sector, but kind of understand those numbers when we can't even hit a hundred billion a year. That that's that's really, really what it takes. And so there needs to be, there needs to be a, I guess, a new global order. Um, then you know, I keep on telling everybody my word for this year's disruption. You know, something has to happen. You know, we're looking forward to um programs like the one you're involved in as well with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. But we need to be talking about scales, we need to be talking to heads of states, and we need to make things happen. I love you putting it in the context of a crisis. Uh, your boss, Secretary General Gutierrez, has mm -hmm. repeatedly sounded the alarm bell of the climate crisis in the context of the IPCC report. And yet the mobilization of capital at scale necessary to address this issue mm -hmm has not been happening. Now, one thing that we at RMI have big conviction behind is that the private sector can help out. And that if we can actually mobilize markets and entrepreneurs and businesses and the private sector, then things can move faster. So we're talking about deploying one and a half trillion dollars in the case of Nigeria alone, trillions of dollars globally, we're going to have to leverage the capital from the private sector. But we also need leverage from financial institutions, mm -hmm. from public mm -hmm. sector and multilaterals. Um, and people talk about blended finance, but so much of that is talk. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that we could see a breakthrough on this issue of mobilizing private sector capital with multilateral money, with blended finance in Sharm el Sheikh at, at the end of the year? Is that is that on the agenda? I'm not sure if it's on the agenda, but I, see, I can't see how it won't be um, because private sector are key. But one thing you have to understand about the private sector is, you know, they have to make money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, So and, and, and they are risk averse as well. So it, it is our jobs to try and push the philanthropy and the DFIs for creating that enabling environment um, along with the sovereigns. Um, that's a very real thing. Um, and it's our job to, to make sure that happens. Right now, I think there's a lot of um, excitement, understandably, on the emerging economies. And, and it would be great to do something and drive private sector to those economies. However, there's very little on developing countries, if we're going to be honest. We don't have like a shopping list <laughs> of private sector ready to come forth in the developing countries. And that's why it's really important to also um, build capacity on the local private sector, on the on the pension funds and just, you know, institutionalize it and understand their markets and get them to help solve their problems with assistance from 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 from, uh, you know, other people. But and that's why I keep on um, I'm harping on the point and is to have right data, correct data, data, investable grade data um, that that is bankable. Thank you. One point you just made capacity building is very much on our list of priorities for the upcoming year. Um, we did a back of the envelope calculation and we think that we just wanted to replace diesel gensets in Nigeria. We need 25,000 more people that can help install mm -hmm. solar, that can develop solar projects, that can finance solar projects. And right now in all of Nigeria, there's about a thousand people in that sector. So we need to train a lot of people. Um, are you focused on that in SE for All? And what do you see as the capacity building priorities? Well, when I was um, back in Lagos State, there was actually a Lagos Energy Academy, which is really still running um, and is training solar technicians. Um, in the REA, we focused on STEM students for girls. And now in SE4, we, are, we have a program called Women of the Forefront, which is focused on training African women for the solar industry. We, we really do feel that, you know, renewables is, is where we hopefully will get gender equality on, on some of these issues. But it's not, it's, it's not big and it's not fast enough. Um, and it's important to do training for employment instead of training for training's sake. Yeah. I, can't, yeah. I can't emphasize that more. 
Um, and in the case of Nigeria, you mentioned this is the 40 gigawatt market that you're trying to replace. It's not the five gigawatts everyone talks about on grid. It's the other part of the economy that no one really talks about. And with the rise in diesel pricing and what's happening in UK, we see people uptaking solar more. So that is something that we want to push Africa-wide you know, which institutions. And this is, you know, when, when we talk about support from the um, developed world, it's not just cash. It's also expertise. It's also, you know, supply chains, um, assembly, schools. You know, there's so much that can be done. And I guess one other point that is really, really important is to um, develop a, a proper carbon market um, for Africa, so you don't get ripped off, which is what is really happening here in terms of the price per ton. And some of these African countries are not comparable to other countries. So there's lots to do. There is lots to do. Um, and uh, we have a, a limited amount of time until the next COP happens. Uh, but before that, uh, a uh, important uh, energy for all forum in Kigali. One of the things that's really exciting to me is the first time in Africa. And I think that it's just so important to show people what that aesthetic looks like and just how amazing um, my people are and just, you know, what is needed and, and, and just all the people coming together. Um, but in terms of what we're trying to get out of it, first, we want to firmly kind of embed this concept that we've been talking about, that you can't talk about energy transition without energy access. And we should stop talking about them as separate things. They're part and parcel of the same thing. You don't go to any heads of state in Africa and say, we want you to transition, but we're not going to tell you how you're actually going to electrify or provide cooking, but we're going to tell you how to transition because they'll tell you to go away. We don't have enough energy. That has to be the starting point. And then I guess finally, what I would really want to happen is have um, almost like a communique that we can take on the way to COP, right? Um, that, that that shows that, you know, the global South has been heard. And these are the things that they're, they're putting forward um, with, you know, all the big institutions in the room. And, you know, trying to try and move um, dialogue to, to implementation. You know these forums, like the most exciting part is more the bilaterals that you end up having um, along the way. But it's, it's, it's really exciting. We're going to have lots of people there. Well, Jules is going to be there. Um, and everyone should come through. And if you can't come in person, please join us virtually. And one thing that strikes me uh, in the conversations that we've been having, uh, particularly in the Global South, is the momentum that is building the awareness that this is actually starting to become a huge opportunity for countries in the global south uh, and the willingness of government leaders uh, to not just wait for somebody to come tell them what they're supposed to do but to take the lead and drive the, the access and transition side by side is very exciting um, there's one more question I have to ask you, Damilola. One thing that strikes me about you is that you are always upbeat, that you are always full of passion and energy. And yet the work that we do between your organization and my organization can sometimes be depressing, can sometimes be challenging. What is it that gives you that unrelenting optimism and that positive outlook? So while I wish I was always upbeat, I think my husband would say differently. Um, I guess what keeps me going is just the fact of who you are trying to serve. And I actually really believe that I'm trying to serve people. These are, you know, I, I feel like I've come from a very fortunate background not to even really know poverty at all. But the people that we're trying to serve have a absolutely nothing. So that has to be behind our minds. That, that has to be there when we are really, really tired or really frustrated just to keep keep on moving. Like I said, it, it's just not acceptable for women to be dying from not having access to clean cooking. It's not acceptable for mortality rates to be so high doing a major operation when electricity is not available. This is 2022, guys. Do you know what I mean? It's just, I just find, I just find it so unacceptable and it, 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 it keeps me going. I don't think there's any more of a rewarding job than kind of influencing the trajectory of someone's life for the better. Well, I must tell you, uh, with that passion and with that um, clear drive to do well, you are an incredible source of all. Um, inspiration. So a big thank you to you, thank you. Uh, Damilola. Drink. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you 
Enkigai. Enkigai.